On his deathbed, the poet Heinrich Heine famously said, God will forgive me. That's his job. It was as presumptuous as it sounds, and I think wrong. But it sort of reflects something that perhaps we're all in danger of thinking. In many ways, it reflects the remarkable privilege that we have of living within a historically Christian culture where the forgiveness of God can be assumed. Because in actual fact, for most of human history and culture, forgiveness is neither simple nor easily available or often even possible. Wrongdoers on the whole would be excluded from society or considerably worse than that. The gods were often callous and vindictive. And even if forgiveness was possible, it was arduous and costly to achieve. And even in the Old Testament, if you think about the process of forgiveness there, there is this complex system of ritual and sacrifice based around the temple in order to know that you are forgiven. Forgiveness is not simple. And yet Jesus teaches us to simply pray, forgive us our trespasses. Simply that. We're working our way through the Lord's Prayer and we're thinking about this next line and it is beautifully simple. Jesus says, forgive us our trespasses. And um, it's a wonderful thing really. It um, mirrors the story that we had in the reading, doesn't it? Uh, you know it well. There's uh, the two men who go into the temple to pray and one of them stands there and tells God how great he is and the other says, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, which of those two men went home right with God? And you know the answer to that. Jesus teaches that forgiveness is found not through, I don't know, penance and good works and sacrifice, but by repentance and humility. Forgiveness costs you nothing but perhaps your pride. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted, says Jesus. However, there's another level to that story that we just had read, and it's not obvious, but it's very interesting. And um, it would have been quite shocking for Jesus' hearers, actually, because don't forget, you're within a Jewish context, and they are there in the temple, and the temple exists for that system of sacrifice for forgiveness. That's really what it's there for. And yet Jesus says, this man, this sinner, genuinely, quite not, not, not a great person, goes home right with God, simply in humility and confession of his sins. Do you see? With no reference at all to the whole temple system. Isn't that interesting? So there's something strange going on there, and we'll try and get to the bottom of it. Before we do that, uh, let's just reflect a little bit on the line in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses. You might be aware that the, that, that word is translated in lots of different ways. So there's actually three different versions of the Lord's Prayer which have three different words, which is right. Can anybody remember what the three words are? You've got, you've got sins and trespasses, good. There is actually another version, not so obvious, anyone? Debts and debtors, very good indeed. Now, the interesting thing is debts and debtors is actually probably the right word, so, um, which is really interesting. So the word that Jesus would have, Jesus spoke Aramaic, and the, the word that he would have said means, on the surface, debts. Um, and actually that's quite a helpful picture, a reminder of what sin means, because uh, you know debts are, well, they need to be paid. They, they don't just go away and they sort of accumulate, you know. They, if you get in debt, they get worse and worse and, and life gets really very messy. And it's interesting that um, um, Matthew translates it as debts. And can anybody remember what Matthew did for a living? 
tax collector. So he was a man who knew about the consequences of debts and how it affected people's lives. And so, therefore, his picture of sin is like a debt which, um, which accumulates and needs to be paid and makes a mess of our lives. Luke uses the, words, uh, the word sin, um, and then we've often translated it as, as trespasses. And those two words, again, have different meanings. So trespass is to cross a line, to go somewhere that you shouldn't have done, to break a rule. Sin is distinct from that. Sin is the idea of an action which doesn't meet a standard. So like in Romans, it says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the interesting thing about that is that, frankly, most of our actions fall short most of the time. So one way or another, we are all in need of forgiveness, you see? And... Um, so we all need forgiveness. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But forgiveness is not easy or simple. And you will know this if you've ever had to forgive somebody who's done something pretty awful to you. C.S. Lewis once said that um, forgiveness is a lovely idea until you have to actually forgive someone. And it's true, isn't it, that actually forgiveness is incredibly difficult. And we're going to reflect more on this next week because it's the next line in the uh, Lord's Prayer. But in, a, in actual fact, we love the idea of it, but in practice, it's incredibly difficult. And in fact, it feels like it's not quite right. If someone's actually done something that's pretty bad, forgiveness feels like, do I not care? Do I not think they should be brought to justice? Shouldn't they have to pay, make amends for what they've done? And if that's true of us, it's another thing altogether for God. Because if you were going to be presumptuous enough to tell God what his job was, which I'm not, but if you were going to do that, God's job is not um, mercy. God's under no obligation to be merciful. But without justice, somehow God ceases to be righteous. He ceases to be holy. He ceases to be fair or just. Do you see what I mean? So if you were to say God has a, a job, well, justice is far more his job than, than mercy is in uh, actual fact. God cannot simply forget about sins or pretend that they don't matter. He cannot simply write off debts as if they didn't actually need to be paid. And yet, of course, Jesus teaches us to pray very simply, forgive us our sins. How is it that he can do that? Taking all of that into account, how is it that he can do that? Well, I wonder whether you can see where this is going. Because what you don't see in the Lord's Prayer or in the story of the, the Pharisee and the tax collector is that what Jesus is doing in his life and his ministry, and don't forget we're approaching Holy Week and Good Friday, Jesus is part of a vast plan of redemption put in place to enact a means by which forgiveness is actually possible. That whole system of sacrifice in the Old Testament, which the Old Testament is pretty clear, couldn't actually do anything to forgive sins, but was a foreshadowing of what Jesus was all about. It was a constant reminder that sin has consequences, debts need to be paid, the scales of justice must be balanced. And the reason Jesus can say, simply pray, forgive us our sins, is because the price that needs to be paid for sins is going to be paid by who? By him. Astonishing. When Jesus says, simply pray, forgive us our sins, it's like, um, it's like someone is giving you a gift of incredible value that has cost them everything to buy for you, and yet just given, just given it out of love and generosity. That, that's what this line looks like. He never says how much it is going to cost him to make it possible that sins can be forgiven. He says, simply pray, forgive us our sins. Isn't that beautiful? So never take for granted the fact that you can be forgiven. Never, like Heinrich Heine, presume on God's forgiveness. 
because it is the most costly thing that you can imagine. And yet it is a gift which is given freely. As I said, it costs you nothing, but perhaps your pride. Forgiveness is richer and more profound, more difficult, more shocking than we can ever imagine. It cost Jesus everything. And so that's one of the reasons why in church we confess every week. I sometimes worry that we go on about it a little bit much. Do you ever have that moment? It's like, oh gosh, confession again, talking about sin again. And it's not because we're obsessed with it, but it's because it's the most precious thing. It's the, the greatest gift. It's because that's all that God asks for us, asks of us, in return for the free gift of forgiveness. And so it's, um, it's really important that we remind one another of the gift that we have and how it is achieved. You don't have to make penance. No sacrifice is required. You don't have to make amend. You just have to honestly confess before God. And, um, and the mercy of God is poured out upon you. And what's the goal of all of this? What's the goal of this kind of this plan of redemption? Well, it's not perfection. I think this is often one of the things we do when we come to confess. We go, well, I confessed this last week and I'm still doing it. It's not perfection. That's not actually the goal. Perfection is not going to be your experience this side of eternity. But what it actually is, is gratitude and joy and humility and freedom. Because that's the picture of the Pharisee and the tax collector the last thing that we want is for you to become like the Pharisee. That's the wrong trajectory. But actually the joy of the, the tax collector who realizes that he's forgiven, that's the experience that we are long for. And that's where our sort of our worship and our uh, praise and our prayer comes out of. We are simply sinners who have discovered forgiveness. And when we are confess, when we confess, we are justified. We are made right with God. And I'd love us to actually just kind of to feel that, to feel the freedom that comes down upon us. There's a lovely line in, um, in Acts. Peter is talking to some of, his, um, uh, some of his community. And he says this. He says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and times of refreshing may come upon you from the Lord. Isn't that a lovely picture? In our confession, in, our, um, in turning to God, we discover that freedom, those times of refreshing that come from having the, the, the price paid, the burden take away, the, the guilt wiped out. You are set free. And I think the other thing is to say, um, you need to believe this. You actually need to take hold of this because a lot of us live with a lot of guilt a lot of the time um, and uh, often it's people who are in church who, sh who, who should understand this better and yet who carry burdens of guilt with them and I understand that and I've known that too but actually the answer to that is not trying to make amends but actually taking hold of this because this is the very heart of the Christian faith this is the gospel in Christ the price is paid. Your sins are wiped away. You are set free. This is what Easter is all about. And so this week, as you continue to pray the Lord's Prayer day by day, how's that going? You doing okay? If you're falling off, off the wagon, you can get right back on it any time. As you're praying it day by day, pause for a moment at this line. Forgive us our trespasses or forgive us our sins. And recognize both the need that you have for forgiveness, but also the lengths that God has gone to make that possible. You remember Jesus on the cross says, his final words, it is finished. And that which is finished is your redemption, is the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus says, it is finished. People of God, believe it. Take hold of it. Allow it to set you free.
Jesus simply teaches us to pray, forgive us our sins. And in that moment, this whole vast cosmic plan of redemption, which comes to its culmination at Good Friday and on Easter Sunday, comes to bear upon us. In that moment, we are made right with God. Forgiveness isn't easy or cheap. It is more costly than we can possibly imagine. God has gone to the greatest lengths to pay the price for your sin. But therefore... Nothing can come between you and the love of God. You are loved. You are forgiven. In Christ, you can be assured of mercy. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, our lives are laid open before you. Rescue us from the chaos and debt of sin. And through the death of your son, bring us healing and make us whole. That we might rejoice in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.